This is working. All right, sounds good. All right, so everyone's like pushed to the back of the room, so I'll try and come out to you guys a little bit. My name is Osha Bratton. I am, those of you who know her, the new Angie Bowen, or at least trying to be. Um, through East Tennessee Children's Hospital, I am what they call the pediatric outreach coordinator, meaning I'm employed by the hospital specifically to educate pre-hospital providers as well as adult ERs in pediatric emergency, how to best take care of them. Another part is I also work at the state level to work through our policies, our standards of care, our rules and regs. So I'm our advocate for Region 1 and 2 at the state level as well. Um, this is my contact information if you ever needed to get in touch with me regarding a pediatric case. Um, pediatric questions, I am at your disposal. I do ask that if you have a follow-up on a specific pediatric case, you go through your leadership. That way I just know that I'm giving HIPAA information to someone I'm 100%, you know, I know can have that information. So a little bit about my background. I am a 10-year pediatric emergency trauma nurse. That's all I've ever done. I am recent recent transplant to San Diego, California. I worked in um, the level one trauma center there. We are back there, we're the only level trauma center, level one trauma center for two counties, so we saw it all. Um, found this job out here, said absolutely that's what I want to be doing. Felt like I could be making a bigger difference in this position, and so here I am. Loving it, so happy I'm finally here. So what we're gonna do today is I have four lectures for you. Um, it'll, you guys will get four pediatric hours. We're going to start out with just basic pediatric assessment. It's probably the same stuff you've heard a bazillion times, but hopefully you can learn at least one new thing about pediatrics. We'll then move into pediatric trauma. We'll talk about jump start. And then there was a brand new pediatric decontamination considerations lecture. So we'll talk a little bit about hazmat as well, because I've heard that that's kind of been the theme for the year. Any questions with that? Of course, if you guys, we'll take breaks in between, but if you need to, go ahead and um, feel free to use the facilities when you need to. So pediatrics. Um, when we talk pediatrics, about 25% of all emergency room visits are peds. So not a huge portion, but definitely not rare by any means. Of that, 75% of those kids are seen in adult facilities. So most kids are being seen in a facility that does not specialize in peds. When you talk about pre-hospital 911 calls, that number goes down even more. And um, But when you look at all these natural disasters, there's a significant amount of kids that are affected by this. And sometimes our mass casualties are only peds. You know, when we talk about Sandy Hook, where patients are peds. Um, which just is, I'm just trying to drive home the fact that peds is not just a one chapter in a textbook. Unfortunately, nursing and pre-hospital providers, when we get our pediatric education, is a very small percentage. But kids do take up a bigger, a bigger portion of our population than we think. So they're not just little adults. They have anatomical and physiological differences that make them special that we have to pay attention to when we're treating them. The other thing is weight-based medications. This is a huge area for error in, in care of pediatrics. And it's not just the calculation part, but also the drawing up of medications. It's not just one amp here and one amp there. So when your adrenaline's running, really trying to hone in on your math, math skills in that moment, trying to figure out how much of a medication you're supposed to be giving. 
We also talk about um, pounds versus kilos. Unfortunately, there's a lot of pounds to kilos issues that result in double medication errors. So when you get your, your pediatric call, the most important thing to do is stay calm. You guys have the information. You know what you need to do. But in order to be able to unlock the information, you have to stay calm. Overall, the most important things are make sure you have your caregiver present as much as possible. They're a good source of information. In addition to, they're really able to kind of help you interact with the kiddo. Make sure you know the kid's preferred name. That's, we got two things going on. One, some of these little guys go by a nickname. So if their name is little Johnny Smith, they go by Bubba, well, they might not know that their actual name is Johnny Smith. So you got to be making sure to call them what they go by. The other side of that is we're seeing a huge uptick in kids who are deciding that they want to go by a different name, meaning maybe he was born Brian, but now he wants to go by Brianna. And while that sometimes is difficult for us to wrap our brain around, there is documented cases of kids kind of being pushed over, pushed over that proverbial ledge and have committed suicide after their interactions with medical providers simply because this component of their care wasn't respected. Um, so keeping that in the back of your mind. Be on their level, both physically and developmentally. So really crouching down, talking to kids as opposed to towering over them, being honest, and then making sure to provide age appropriate distractions. Overall, kids have three general fears. Number one is the unknown. The more they don't know, the more they make up, the more scared they get. So as much as you can, explain. Pain is a huge factor when it comes to fear. Um, and then separation from caregivers, even your older kids. 14, 15 year olds, they always break down as soon as their parents walk through the door because underneath it all, they just, they need their caregiver there next to them. So what we'll do is we'll go through all six of the age categories um, and just talk about differences in physiological and anatomically. So our neonates are birth to 20 brand new babies and for those of you who have kids, and how many people have kids in here? About well, most of us, okay. So in this age, they don't do much. They eat, they sleep, they poop, and they do it all over again. They're not very exciting creatures right now. They have reflexive behavior, which is important when you're talking about their neurological status. So normal babies have a flexion posture. Their arms and their legs come up by their sides. In adults, if we see this, or even our older kids, we worry. We call it posturing. There's something neurological going on. The opposite are in infants and our neonates. If they're not curled up like that and they're linked with their arms on their side, something is wrong. That's not a normal posture for a baby. Initially, they'll have about a 5 to 10% weight loss, and that's early on they're burning some of the fat stores they have to maintain their, their temperature. Totally normal. They'll fatten up as they move along. And then we talk about hypothermia and hypoglycemia, which are your two most important um, emergencies in babies. Almost everything that can happen to a neonate can result in one or the other. So paying attention to those two things when you pick up these little guys is really important. Next, we have our infants. Those are our 1 to 12 month olds. During this phase, they're growing both um, physically and developmentally very rapidly. They about triple their weight in their first year. They start having dan stranger danger at about three to six months, which means they're recognizing their caregivers and they're recognizing that you don't know you, which kind of triggers a little bit of a panic response in them. If they do have stranger danger, that should also trigger something in your brain as to why is this kid not afraid of strangers? doesn't necessarily mean that there's something going on, but it should just make you tune in a little bit more to the social if situation that's going on. Um, Really important for these little guys, when they're learning at this point, they're learning by putting stuff in their mouth. Their fingers, their, to their toes, the little toy that's found on the ground that then becomes a foreign body, grandma's blood pressure or you know blood sugar medication that she accidentally dropped on the floor last week. All those things go in the mouth, which can make treating these guys a little bit difficult, especially when they are maybe altered and you don't know that they ate that medication. You kind of have to run through your H's and T's very quickly to, to rule some stuff out. Miles in this age group are really important, especially when you talk, start talking about trauma and child abuse. 
You have to know your milestones in order to kind of wrap your brain around whether or not their injuries could be greater than what's presenting on the outside. So birth to two months, they're not doing much. They kind of lay there. They may turn their head. They can start directly looking at you as opposed to kind of the googly-eyed baby early on. They can't really focus. So until two months, they're not doing much. Once they hit two to six months, they start rolling over a little bit more. Um, they can recognize their caregivers. They can make eye contact. They start kind of using expressions, smiling at you, which is important because when you get a call and you go out that for the two-month-old that rolled off the bed, that story shouldn't make sense. A two-month-old really at that point doesn't have the force to be rolling over. And if they're sustaining an injury and the story doesn't match, that should attune you to something else going on and this baby could have more serious injuries than you initially thought. Um, six to 12 months old, this is when they really start getting mobile. They start cruising and um, cut off. But right here, there's a baby kind of holding on to the couch. And they grab onto maybe the table and kind of pull themselves along until they can stay on their own. It's called cruising. They start getting a lot of bumps and bruises on their forehead, which can be normal. They start teething, and then this is the point when our babies can start eating soft foods. Anything before this is a little bit too early, and you really risk having aspiration or, or getting a foreign body. So um, really important, sometimes an education point when you see some of your patients eating a little bit before this. Physiologically, our infants and neonates, up until, I don't know, about eight months or so, they're obligate nose and nose breathers, meaning they're not smart enough to realize that if they just open their mouth, they would be able to breathe through their mouth. And this is important when you start talking about winter season and getting congested. If baby's noses get congested or swollen enough, they can have significant difficulty breathing. Every once in a while, it can be normal for babies to use their bellies to breathe. If they're sucking in underneath their ribs, that's a different story, but they do frequently use their belly muscles to help them move air. They have a double the metabolic rate that we do, meaning they need more, double the glucose and double the oxygen. Um, we talked about they have these primary reflexes. They should be symmetrical on both sides, that flexion posture. Those are normal for them. And then they can't control their temperature and they can't control their blood pressure, which is important when you talk about compensation. So in assessing infants, the most important thing, again, stay because when you get anxious, they get anxious. They can kind of feed off that. So staying calm, keep them with the caregiver as much as you can. Do your across-the-room assessment. We call it the pediatric assessment triangle. It's been called a couple of other things. But that appearance, breathing, circulation from across the room before you even lay hands on them. Because as soon as you lay hands on a kiddo and they start screaming, your assessment's out the window. And you've got to kind of piece it together and guess what was going on before you got there. Make sure to keep them covered. Um, and then for their little people, make sure if they have a pacifier or another comforting thing, bring it along with you because that will make your life a little bit easier. Little babies, about six months and less, actually have um, pain relief with sucking. It's an anxiety reliever. It's a pain relief. It releases chemicals in the brain. So having that pacifier, especially with an injury, can help you kind of calm that infant and make them feel a little bit better. I forgot to tell you guys, if you have questions, please interrupt me. I'll make this a little bit more entertaining. Anyone have a one to three year old? Yeah? What's the, what's the favorite word at this age? Two years old. Dad. Oh, that's a good one. No. No or mine. Mine, mine, mine. It's because at this point they're really building their autonomy. They're they're trying to think about being little humans. They want to make their own decisions. They want to be in control. And it's just part of the, de the developmental process. They're really curious. They're really starting to learn. They're starting to get verbal, which is really fun because some of the things these people, these little guys say are just hilarious. Um, again, with these guys, you want to avoid separation from the caregiver as much as you can. Keep them with someone that they know. It'll make your assessment a little bit easier. Do your across-the-room assessment because, again, even... These little guys will start freaking out as soon as you touch them. Give them choices as much as you can. And when I say choices, not yes or no choices, because they'll always say no, and then you're going to stop. 
but if you need to do blood pressure, asking them, do you want me to do it on this arm or this arm? I need to listen. Should I listen here? Should I listen here with your stethoscope? And kind of giving them control, but at the same time getting getting what you need to get done done. As much as you can, incorporate play or touch. Um, a great example is when little guys have a doll, a toy, listening to their doll or toy before you listen to them with your stethoscope. Again, it takes about five seconds, and it'll get you just a little bit more street cred with them. And they're a little bit more inclined to let you do what you need to do. Prepare them right before a procedure. Don't um, mention or anything like that until otherwise you'll lose them. Um, and then, of course, the word's all done. That, those are your magical words to kind of bring them back off the ledge and let them know it's going to be all right. Preschoolers, this is by far my favorite age group because these little guys are smart, man. You can have full-on conversations with some of these four- and five-year-olds. Um, they are starting to ask more questions. What's the favorite question of a four-year-old, five-year-old? Why? But why, Mom? But why, Dad? I don't know. That's just the way it is. So they also have this magical thinking, which can sometimes lead to um, some difficulties in care. For example, if they have a broken arm, first thing they think is, oh my gosh, they're going to chop my arm off now. Now my arm is going to go away. Um, when you talk about surgery with a little guy, sometimes they think their guts are just going to come out of their body. So really trying to explain to them in words they can understand what assuring them that it's going to be okay, you're there to help them. They interpret words literally. So my favorite example is when you say cat scanner, a kid will think, I'm going to go to a scanner, but there's a whole bunch of like cats running around. That's what they envision. So really trying to use words that make sense to them. They usually in this age range will see punishment or their illness or whatever's happening, or they will see illness and injury as a punishment. Sometimes they'll try and bargain with you, like, I'll be good if you just stop. Good. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just a little bit heartbreaking, but just reassuring them that it's not their fault. You're going to help them get better. And then even more so in this age category, letting them know right before you do something that you're going to do it. So as you're setting up your IV, is not the time to be talking to them about the needle. And they're going to ask you questions. You, you. My best response is, you know, we'll talk about that in just a minute. I'm doing something. Get all set up, and then one step at a time, explain it to them. Putting a stretchy rubber band around your arm. I'm cleaning with the cold soap. And now I have to do a little pinch, but it's going to be over soon, and then get it done. And before they even know it, you've got your IV in place, and you're good to go. Now, going back to all this, this is, of course, in those non-emergent situations. When you have a true life-threatening emergency, you're just going to intervene. You're going to intervene as quickly as you need to. But these are mostly the kids that are awake and talking and, and still mentating with you. So preschoolers, again, that across-the-room assessment is imperative because even some of these kids will freak out when you try and touch them, do their blood pressure. Assess their level of understanding. Again, there's some four- and five-year-olds who can have a full-on conversation with you, and they understand more than you think. So while you're getting a history from mom, they're taking in all that, and they're processing it the way a three- to five-year-old does. They're, they're kind of blowing it up into their mind. They don't understand, but they don't know the right questions to ask. So just recognize that as you're talking around them, they understand Using special words, meaning um, special straw instead of an IV, things that they can kind of relate to, because an IV doesn't, doesn't translate to these little guys. My favorite, use dressings freely. Band-Aids fix everything. If you have an upset kid, give them a Band-Aid, and they'll be happy with you. Five to 12-year-olds, um, this is a big age gap, and what five-year-olds are doing is not necessarily where the 12-year-olds are but it kind of encompasses them all into that young school age child. So as they get into this age category, they're starting to hear more separation from their friends, whereas before it was always, you know, mom and dad, mom and dad. They're recognizing the value of their friends at this point. And a lot of these kids, their biggest concern is, am I ever going to be able to go back to school? Am I ever going to get to play football again? Am I ever going to, can I go to my dance recital tomorrow? Those are the most important things in their world at that time. They're starting to... Uh, they can understand consequence of their actions, which unfortunately they learn by trial and error. So we're seeing a lot more risk-taking behaviors in this age category, drug use, alcohol use, unfortunately um, self-harming behaviors are starting to emerge really early in this age. So it's um, allowing for a, a whole new set of issues that we really never had to deal with before. 
With these guys, you want to allow them participation. Starting as early as years old, I'll address the kid before I will mom and dad. You know, obviously acknowledge them by asking the kiddo, what's going on today? Why are you here? What's hurting you? You'd be surprised how much information you can get from a five or six year old all the way. And then I ask mom and dad to fill in all the extra information. And sometimes they're like, yeah, that's exactly what happened. There's nothing additional for me to tell you. And then it just lets them know that you value them, they feel important, and they're more likely to, to um, allow you to do what you need to do. Being honest is really important. If something's going to hurt, tell them it's going to hurt. Don't sugarcoat it. Just let them know. I mean, be nice about things, but be honest at the same time. Because you lie to them, that's it. Your, your trust's out the window. And then give them time to ask questions. and Value their questions and give them answers as best you can. And it's okay to say, you know, I don't know. We'll figure that out later. But give value to their questions. And then adolescents. Anyone have a teenager? Yeah? They know everything. They're invincible, right? They don't really need you. Or so they'd like you to think. At this point, really yeah. the importance in their life is fitting in. Which, again, for a lot of issues. Especially when we talk about cyberbullying. When we talk about the and behavioral health that we're seeing, or behavioral health issues. A lot of SI, a lot of self-harm. Um, and it all stems from this idea of fitting in and needing to be perfect in school. So, again, we're seeing, we see a lot more risk-taking behaviors, alcohol use, drug use. And sometimes these kids don't even know uh, that they've been exposed to something. They'll drink something or eat something from a friend at school just because they were told to, and it's been laced with something. So a lot of um, accidental ingestions or not necessarily accidental, but ingestions they don't want to admit to. And then those lovely mood swings. We, I think we all can remember being a teenager. Um, can make it a little bit difficult to kind of get the full story from these guys. But most important, listen to them, respect their privacy, try and be non-judgmental. I think one of the most important things is when you have these guys in the back of the truck and you're doing your assessment, you have a really special moment to do a health risk screening with them. Sometimes when we get them to the hospital, it's really hard to get the parents to step out of the room or the kid feels like even if they tell us certain things, um, their parents are still going to find out. And when you're the, If you're in the back of the truck by yourself with them, or have a moment alone, ask those questions about drug use, about SI, about domestic violence, and hopefully they'll divulge something to you. Well, not hopefully, but if there's something to divulge, hopefully they'll feel it's a safe place to tell you, and then we can take care of it on the back end. Has anyone had a teenager do their initial SI um, with you on your assessment? It can be pretty, um, it can be pretty, um, overwhelming when you hear one of these guys say, yeah, I've been thinking about killing myself for a while and I've never told anyone. But you're, that's a special moment for you to assess their life. Um, all in all with kids, their response to illness and injury is going to depend on the, all these various um, factors. So their age, both physically and then their developmental age. Their actual acuity versus perceived acuity, especially when you talk about little kids thinking the only fix for their broken arm is to, for you to chop it off. They think everything is much worse than it really is. Uh, severity of pain, previous experiences, like our chronic kids, sometimes react very differently to assessments, IVs. You can have some of those kids who are like three and four who will just sit there and let you poke them because they know that's what they need to do. Coping mechanisms, and then cultural beliefs and practices, which sometimes can be a little difficult for us to wrap our brains around because we, we have the education to know that some of these practices don't necessarily help. But if they're not harmful to the kiddo, there's no sense in just letting them go along with it, those special creams or whatever is important to that family. Caregivers, when you talk about pediatrics, is a, um, can be a little overwhelming. Family units can be just one person, mom, dad, grandma, all the way up to the entire apartment complex wants to be there, wants to go with you to the hospital, wants to give you their side of the story. So sometimes it can be a little bit difficult to kind of sort through that information. Again, remain calm. Let them know you value them, but just sort it out. Try and find out who that main caregiver is and, and have them be your talking person. Any questions about any of that? All right. 
So when we talk about phys um, physical differences, um, we'll go top to bottom here, but the number one thing starting at the top is those big bobble heads that our kids have. They have these huge, massive heads um, that cause two different issues. One, positioning of the airway. The back of their head is really big, and when you lay them flat, it'll flex their, their head forward and kind of close off their airway, which is really important when you start talking about intubation, accidental extubation. You really want to make sure you get that head lined up where it's supposed to be and then don't move it. And then they have a higher center of gravity, which means they're like little lawn darts when they fall. They go up and they come down head first, um, making their head the number one impact for injuries and falls. Fontanelles are important when you talk about increased ICP because they can compensate for longer periods of time. Little babies with head injuries sometimes have delayed diagnosis simply because they've been able to compensate for a little bit. Um, fontanelles will usually close up completely by 18 months. Up until then, they have some, some semblance of some movement in their skull. Uh, and then source of heat loss. So anyone who doesn't have a lot of hair will tell you when it's cold outside, there's a huge difference between wearing a hat and not wearing a hat. So in your little baby, you have to that you keep your head covered. So that they don't move. When you talk about the nervous system of a, of a small child, it's very fragile. The tissue is more susceptible to injury with the same amount of force um, that an adult would experience. So if we both get hit in the head by the same ball at the same force, the kid's at more risk simply because their tissue is more fragile, it tears easier, they bleed a little bit easier. The, the, little, the little brains of these little guys need twice the blood flow than ours do which is important when you start talking about hypoxic events. Remember, their metabolic rate is double ours, which means double the glucose, double the oxygen. So if they have a hypoxic event, if they um, have a little bit of perfusing their brain, they're more susceptible to permanent damage. So really important when you talk about bagging kids versus intubation. If you get in there and you're looking around and it's a tiny airway, you don't see your landmarks, bag that kiddo. It's okay. Studies have found that um, multiple episodes of multiple attempts at intubation are more harmful than just bagging a kid all the way in because of that hypoxia. Um, the flexion syndrome, we talked about that. Increased ICP can be compensated because of those fontanelles. And then just making sure that you know what's age appropriate for that kiddo so you can appropriately assess their level of consciousness. Spinal columns, kids have very weak, lax neck, neck muscles, which I think when we think about babies, we understand that. We know they have these floppy heads, you have to support their neck. But this is true all the way up through childhood. And it takes a while for their muscles to really mature and really be able to support that head 100%, especially when you start talking about trauma. The spinal column is um, has incomplete calcification, meaning their bones are still a little soft. They are at risk for something called sclera, which is injuries without radiographic abnormalities. And the idea behind that is they can have an injury to their spinal cord without having a physical injury to their spinal column. So you have a football player who's complaining about numbness and tingling in his, in his bilateral hands after a head-to-head -head injury. You flip him over, his back's totally fine, no, no tenderness at all. He still needs to be considered a spinal cord injury until it's ruled out because they can have those injuries but not necessarily have a bony issue. Even in the hospital, we won't see those on um, x-rays or CT scan to go for an MRI. Higher fulcrum, meaning um, as they grow, their head kind of sits a little bit deeper on their spinal column, and as they grow, it it moves out a little bit. So if you do see cervical injuries, less than eight, you're usually going to see a C1, C2, those devastating injuries. And as they get older, it'll move down to more C3 Spinal column injuries um, are very uncommon. If you do see them, it's usually a, a pretty big force, like an MVA or a pretty significant sports injury. Neck and airway, um, I don't think, I think this is all stuff that we're pretty much have pounded into our head, but I think it's a good review. Again, our infants and neonates are obligate nose breathers. They have to be able to breathe through their nose. The short necks mean them, that their airways easily obstruct, but more importantly, 
your ET tube can get dislodged very easily. It doesn't take much of a flexion or an extension for it to come out of the right place and go to where it's not supposed to be. So when you have an extension, you risk right main stem intubation. And when you have an accidental flexion, you can actually have dislodgement and then esophageal intubation. So again, once you get that tube placed or your medic gets that tube placed, make sure you keep their head midline, no flexion. It can be a little bit difficult if you're doing compressions because even compressions can dislodge a tube if you're doing them forcefully enough. They have um, large tongues, which we all know, small mouths, large tongues, small workspace. The larynx is anterior and superior, meaning that um, cricoid pressure isn't routine anymore, but you probably will need it for some of these little guys just to actually be able to push the vocal cords to into your into your view, and that's okay. Um, you can barely see it, but then the other one's cut off, but this one's really cylindrical. This one's kind of in the middle, and then over here there's an infant airway, and you can really see that it does start out funnel shape and it eventually gets cylindrical like this. This transformation starts at about the age of eight. That might, may or may not be a question on the paper in front of you. Um, and then really they, the airway really starts looking more adultish at about 12 years old. So between 8 to 12 is kind of when that transformation is taking place. Chest walls, um, babies tend to be, or our little kids tend to be very flexible. They can have a force exerted and their rib cage will kind of bend in and then spring back out. They won't have those fractures. However, that the absence of fractures or um, injury does not necessarily mean there's not an injury underneath. So if you have a kid who's had a chest wall injury, they're complaining of pain, you need to do a really good assessment to make sure you're not missing anything. Um, now this is a little infant, you can see he's got I think eight fractures on this side and I think four on the other side. If a baby has fractures in their rib cage, they've sustained a significant amount of force and they almost always have an injury underlying, whether it's a, contu a contusion, a hemothorax, a pneumothorax. When you do have babies that have hemothorax, or little kids, they can lose about 40% of their circulating volume in their chest cavity, which is significant. Um, Respiratory-wise, um, again, they have an increased oxygen demand and an increased respiratory rate. But on the flip side, they don't have much tidal volume and they don't have much capacity, which means they fatigue out really fast and they get hypoxic really fast. So with kids, you're really quick to provide them oxygen and keep them stabilized. Um, does our internet work? Does Wi-Fi work? Okay. So I just wanted to show you guys this video because sometimes little babies and infants do some weird breathing things. Um, we'll see if this works. Any questions so far? Okay. If it, if it doesn't work, that's okay too. I'll show it after. Okay, sounds good. Um, cardiovascular. So when we talk about cardiac output in our kids, Cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. Um, that's a very common equation for all of us, I think. Um, kids cannot control their stroke volume. They cannot make their hearts beat stronger. They cannot make them beat more effectively. All they can do is increase their heart rate in order to increase their cardiac output. So when you have a kid who's tachycardic, it's really important to investigate why. It could be as simple as they have a fever. And you treat the fever, and it's going to go down. And you're, and but kids will increase their heart rate to tell you other things. They will increase it to let you know that they're hypoxic, even though it might not be showing up on the um, monitor. They'll increase um, their heart rate to an early sepsis or an early shock. They'll increase their heart rate to let you know they're in trouble. So when you see a tachycardic kiddo, you need to figure out why you need to intervene. The heart rate should respond to your interventions. If not, you need to delve into it a little bit further. That's their warning, so that's their canary in the, in the mine, if you will. Um, so for circulating volume, an infant will have about 90 mLs of circulating volume per kilogram of weight. 
a child will have about 80, which again may or may not be a question that is of importance to you. Um, so if you have about an eight, nine pound kiddo, it's like a two month old, well, it can be a neonate all the way up to about a two month old, depending on how big they are. They're about four kilos, four times 90, what's their circulating volume? 360, right? This is about a little, this is between four and 500 ml of fluid. This is their entire circulating volume. So you, when you roll up on an infant who's had some blood loss, it doesn't take much for them to be volume depleted, which is really important when you're talking about early interventions, early fluid replacement. And it doesn't take bleeding. It could be as simple as vomiting and diarrhea for a few days and they haven't been eating. That can be very significant for a kid. Um, your blood pressures, this is 72 times the age in years. This is how we figure it. Just a note, this is bare minimum perfusion pressures for kids. If you have a kid whose pressure is seven, exactly 70 plus two times the age, that is your bare minimum to be perfusing your brain, your kidneys, your heart. You really want it higher than that. Ideal would be 90 plus two times the age. Um, and they will compensate their blood pressure up to a loss of 25%. So once that baby's lost, I don't know, about this much fluid, they're going to start bottoming out their pressure, which isn't much. Um, these are just math equations. Um, so just recognize that, again, hypotension's late. Hopefully you're catching your issues with the tachycardia and well before that, because once you hit hypotension, you're, you're pretty far down the spectrum. Our babies, um, our little guys, have these big bellies. They have really thin, weak muscles in their bellies which means that they are susceptible to injury. Um, we'll go through this a little bit more. I have a, the trauma lecture next to it. The bones, um, they have growth plates, which is important when we talk about healing bones. So we have to make sure that we're identifying um, and treating these guys because certain fractures inhibit bone growth in kids. Uh, and I'm going to skip through some of this because, again, we're, I have the trauma lecture right after this that addresses some of it. Talking about skin, kids have a higher body surface area to weight ratio, which when we talk about hazmat is important because they have an increased rate of absorption. They also have a thinner, their skin is thinner, and so it's more permeable. Babies will model, they'll give you this kind of lacy pattern on their skin to let you know that they're sick. It can be that they have a fever, it can be that they're cold, it can be that they're in shock and they're not perfusing. Babies will be modeled for many, many different reasons. It's like that heart rate. You have to figure out why. You have to treat it. Metabolic concerns. Um, kids have very limited glycogen stores. They don't have a lot of glucose stored up. And again, they burn through it twi twice as fast as us, which means they need replacement earlier than adults do. Um, if they have respiratory difficulty, recognize that if they're young, they probably haven't been eating well either. So if they're altered, you need to check a glucose. Um, this kind of explains a little bit more why it's really important to keep your neonates warm. They have something called brown fat, which is a special type of fat that every baby is born with. It's not the same as um, our adipose tissue. Um, and it's typically there to provide heat for these little guys. So when they're little babies, they cannot shiver. It's not possible. So what their body does is breaks down this brown fat, and a byproduct of that is it's a chemical reaction um, that I can't dive into more than that because I don't really understand it beyond that. But they have a byproduct of heat. They also have a byproduct of lactic acid because it's anaerobic. So as they're breaking this down, they're becoming more and more acidosis. If you don't provide heat for your baby, you are going to cause metabolic acidosis and your situation is going to get worse. Keep them warm. Um, and I know one of, the, one of the things that's been recommended is babies need the same amount of clothes we're wearing plus one layer. But if you're in the back of the truck and you're scrambling, you're at meds and you're doing things, you're producing body heat. So while you're sweating, your baby might still be cold. So you've got to keep the back of your truck warm. You've got to keep their heads covered up at least. Any questions on any of those things? Right. So when you go to pick up your baby or your kiddo, 
Um, obviously, you're going to do safety first. As you're walking around, you really want to take inventory of your surroundings. You're looking for um, pills, drugs, chemicals to that kiddo. Because once you get to their bedside or once you get to their side, they may be so sick that you don't have another opportunity to look around at your surroundings. Um, and we just want to make sure that as you're going into the home, you're taking an opportunity to make sure that home's a safe place for that kid. This is that pediatric assessment triangle I was talking about. Again, it's been called other things, the across the room assessment. The idea is appearance, breathing, circulation. And that's all before you get on the kid. When they talk about appearance, this kind of, I feel like it gets a little confusing because what they're really referring to is mentation. Is that kid sitting? Are they talking with mom? Um, are their eyes open or is their head kind of rolled back and, they, and they're not responding to you? And what that tells you is perfusion to the brain. And when you talk about perfusion, you're doing two things. You're talking about, um, or actually three things. You're talking about their oxygen status. You're talking about their glucose status, as well as their actual volume, their circulating perfusion in general. Work of breathing, this is not... Um, Air, um, listening to their lung sounds. This is looking from across the room. Are they grunting? Do, can I hear him wheezing from over here? Strider, retractions. And then, of course, circulatory issues, so cyanosis and, and pallor. And from that, you know right off the bat, sick, sicker, or sickest. So when you get to a kiddo who has any abnormal, abnormality in that, you need to address it before you move them. So if they're toxic and blue, you need to give them oxygen before you get them moved to the stretcher, before you get them moved to the truck. Because the 60 seconds that it takes you to get them moved could be the 60 seconds that cause this kiddo to arrest. Most kids arrest because of respiratory issues, not because of cardiac. So you have to intervene and give them that support before you go um, moving them. Now, if it's a dangerous situation or not safe, of course that's different. Uh, scoop and go. Um, your weights. Um, Every ambulance service in uh, Region 2 is getting PD sleeves. Have you heard that? So we're going to be getting PD sleeves. Does everyone know what a PD sleeve is? It's pretty cool. So um, it comes with a, a little Braslow tape, and then what you do is you figure out what color your kid is. It's like a jump bag with all these sleeves that look like the quarterback, you know, play sleeves. And you have all your drugs on there. It's on your arm. You don't have to keep referring to the tape. It's just right there. You can read it. It's customizable to your medications, your policies, your standards of care. It's really cool. Um, so, of course, we're going to do our primary assessment, airway, breathing, circulation, and then disability. So, airway, of course, is it open? Is it maintainable? Do you need to suction the nose? What are the, um, some of the tools you have in your truck to suction a baby's nose? I know it sounds like a trick question, but... Bulb syringe, do those always work really great? No, right? What about those um, soft suction catheters? Sometimes you use them for trachs or ET tubes. You can use those as well with the wall suction. You just only put in the very end of the suction catheter, and you get a lot more force behind it, and you can usually clear out a nose really well. You want to be really careful about suctioning the mouth. If you have a hypoxic kiddo and you make them brady down, you're going to have some issues. Um, so suctioning out the nose sometimes can be more effective of course, if you want to suction the mouth, make sure you're doing it kind of in the cheek area. Um, breathing, this is when you get your stethoscope on, you're listening. Are they wheezing? Do they have strider? Do they have everything at once? <clears throat> Making sure you're paying attention to retractions, nasal flaring, work of breathing. Now, you have to reassess the respiratory status on the kid very frequently. And I'm talking every few minutes or so, especially when you have a sick kid. Because it doesn't take long for them to poop out. And they'll go from being somewhat okay in one second to really not being okay the next second. So if you're doing interventions and they're not getting better, you need to up it and go to the next step. So maybe that nasal cannula isn't working. Let's get a monitoring breather. Um, circulation, we talked about the importance of heart rate, making sure that you're assess or you're looking at why they're tachycardic and really trying to fix that and and doing an intervention. Sometimes on the really, really young kids, doing a, a distal pulse or even sometimes a central pulse isn't the most accurate way to count a heart rate. Sometimes you just need to get your stethoscope on the chest and do an apical rate. And the even more so, sometimes
sometimes you need to listen for, and do a 30 second count as opposed to a 15 second count. Our little guys, their heart rates vary so much that doing a 15 second heart rate isn't always accurate. So if you have a sick kid, you may opt to listen for about 30 seconds and, and double it as opposed to 15. Um, so when you have a circulation issue, your kid's tachycardic, your kid's bradycardic, the number one thing you want to do is ventilate them. Get some oxygen in them, because again, respiratory is usually why our kids code. If that doesn't work, the next thing you want to look for in your sick kid is a fluid bolus. And how much do we give our 20 mils, perfect. Um, that doesn't work, you want to start thinking about warming measures or cooling measures, depending on if they're hot or cold. Once you got airway breathing, circulation down, about disability, your abs poo. Again, if they're not mentating, oxygen needs them. More often than not, they're not mentating because they're not oxygenating, they're not perfusing. So give them some oxygen, bag them if you You want to get a cervical collar, obviously, if there's um, any history of trauma. Fluids, we want to make sure they're not volume depleted, and that's why they're not perfusing their brain. And then what's the last thing you need to consider? Well, not the last thing, but the next thing, I guess I should say. Glucose. Check a glucose on our kids. Super, super important and gets missed more often than you would think. Um, then there's a whole secondary assessment. I will tell you there's sometimes you don't have time to get to a secondary and you're just working on doing ABC and that's fine. We don't need the rest of it. Um, exposure and environmental control. So the first thing you want to do on your little people is expose them. Get them undressed. Look at their skin. Flip them over. Check their back out. Make sure there's nothing you're missing. I had this one mom come in with her new baby. He was two months old. I said, I don't know. Something's wrong. Every once in a while, he sort of gets blue in the mouth, but I'm not certain. I don't really know what's happening. Other than that, he's eating well. He's doing fine. I said, okay. So we sat there. We're kind of talking as I'm watching him. I have him on the pulse ox, and sure enough, he starts turning blue. Like, okay. And I looked over at my pulse ox and it's going down. It's like mid 80s, dropping. Put some oxygen on him. Get him totally unwrapped, completely unwrapped. His little foot on the left side was ticking. That's it. He was seizing. That's the only way he had to tell us that, hey, something's wrong. And if he had not been completely unwrapped, that would have gone missing completely. So get them unwrapped, check them out. Once you have them unwrapped and you've looked at them, F is for full set of vital signs. If you haven't already done them, and then get make sure you're taking care of the family, letting them know what's going on. Um, give comfort measures. We're talking about pain. Kids, unfortunately, are frequently under-medicated for pain. I think because um, there's a misunderstanding that kids don't feel pain or they don't feel the same, which we all know they do. And a little bit of fear with giving kids narcotics. As long as it's age-appropriate, give it to them. Now, I will say that when you do give morphine, sometimes you have to help the morphine work, meaning kids also have a lot of anxiety. So you give, say, hey, I'm giving you some pain medicine. It's going to take a little while to work. But in the meantime, let's talk about something else and kind of get their mind off of what's happening. And that will give the morphine a little bit of a chance to work. Then you can do your head-to-toe assessment, make sure you didn't miss anything, get your sample history, and then flip them over and check out their back, make sure you didn't miss anything. Special needs kiddos are um, are a whole different breed, if you will. Your parents and your caregivers are your number one helpers. You have to keep them nearby. Even having done this for 10 years, there's not a week that goes by that someone doesn't come into my ER with some sort of syndrome that I have never heard of in my entire life. And so what I'll do is I'll ask them, what does that mean? What does that encompass? And they usually try and give me a short answer, and I say, uh-uh. Does that affect, and I will list them off, his heart, his lungs, his kidneys, his liver, and list everything off, because sometimes parents forget the important parts of their syndromes. And, that, and then don't forget metabolic, is there any sort of blood sugar issues that go along with this? And that will hopefully help them to prompt to give you the information that you need. But keeping them nearby, most often than not, they can kind of walk you through how to help their kiddo, suction, don't suction, usually we do this, usually we don't do this, and they just need you to be hands-on and help get them to the emergency department. The other thing that's important with these little guys is we talk about babies not having reserves. Even more so, our chronic kids have zero reserves. So a heart baby that just has a simple cold can actually become very sick very quickly. 
Any questions? I know, again, that's a lot of basic information that you hear every time we talk about kids, but I think it's still really important to go over, and um, hopefully you got at least one piece of new information. Like a two-minute break, and we'll jump into the next one? Not really two minutes. We'll go a little bit longer. Like five, ten minutes. Sound good? Okay.